everyone. For those of you who, who has joined us for the first time, let me say that we've been meeting every Thursday. We had uh, 10 Thursday meetings already. We have looked into uh, all kinds of crops, including winter crops, uh, rape seeds, uh, and wheat, whatever. You have a chance, if you missed all the previous meetings, to watch the video recordings on YouTube. Uh, my name is Voronsov Vitali of this uh, AgroCare Agricultural Advisory Service. We are supported by the Swiss-Ukrainian uh, project, development of the added value trade in organic farming and dairy products uh, we are also supported by feeble and uh, safoso swiss uh, our information partner is organic info you can find a lot of useful information there our today's topic is announced uh, we are going to talk about any crops uh, and uh, it's going to be main focus is going to be in uh, soil fertility and water. We are going to pay the most attention to organic te technologies. Our organic club discussion uh, today is going to be uh, uh, nitrogen fixation, phosphomalization, uh, and composting according to jo Johnson's method. method. We have great experts with us today. I'm going to hold the frame for the discussion today and we will have another topic of discussion later. So now we are going to listen to a presentation about the requirements for organic regulation of fertilizers and soil improvement. It's going to be delivered by Ivan uh, Havran, the leading certification specialist of the organic standard uh, certification company. You can start sharing your screen Ivan can you see my screen yes we can see it you can uh, you can make it bigger please yes good afternoon everyone we are living in difficult times my mission today is quite simple I am going to tell you more about the organic standards and regulations, what we have to do to improve uh, soil fertility and what we can use in order to achieve better yields and better uh, efficiency. In the framework we are setting up for ourselves, namely to work effectively uh, while keeping the balance of organic far farming. Organic certification and standards uh, is a, a subject area where I worked since 2006. So now I'm a senior certification specialist and coordinator of in input groups. Uh, we uh, focus mainly on uh, assessment of our group practices. I mostly focus on uh, hor horticulture, uh, livestock production, uh, beekeeping, uh, aquaculture processing inputs. We work both with European standards and uh, Ukrainian uh, legislation. Based on um, additional products origin or source uh, we can look at the european regulation uh, now we are going to have regulation 848 instead of the previous versions what's the difference uh, between them if we speak generally about the principles that uh, are these, these standards are based on, they are not so much different. Uh, 
uh, even though uh, there is not much difference, the current standard is going to be more strict and more uh, stringent. Uh, the uh, auxiliary products for the agriculture are regulated in terms of what's allowed to use uh, from among uh, animal products, uh, disinfectants, disinsectants, and so on. Their origin has to be from four uh four uh sources animal source plant source microbial and mineral source what kind of uh regulations uh, what kind of uh restrictions do these regulations have resources that have to be renewable that's the key limitation I'm going to highlight this uh, repeatedly during my presentation. These standards and regulations are uh, updated regularly and uh, certain substances or compounds uh, are found in order to replace uh, non-renewable uh, materials that were used before. What does this uh, regulation 848 say? That soil management and cultivation have to maintain or increase soil organic matter, enhance soil stability, biodiversity, and prevent soil compaction and erosion. These are the key objectives for all the techniques and measures we use in our farms uh, when we work with soil. At the same time, uh, biological uh, ac activity of the soil has to be maintained and increased. I know that um, my colleagues today are going to speak, among other things, about legumes. Uh, and that's especially relevant for them. In fact, this is the foundation upon which all the approaches have to be based in uh, agricultural production. But there is always one but. We cannot provide criteria or parameters of soil, the soil compaction, and so on, um, indicated on the previous slide, uh, for various reasons, both objective and subjective ones. Uh, in Ukraine, we have our specific issues. Uh, we cannot uh, introduce and apply manure uh, for many reasons, what can we uh, get it replaced with? Probably it could be dried farmyard manure, farmyard manure, dehydrated poultry manure, composted animal excrement. All these components have to uh be sourced not from intensive uh animal husbandry here we come to definition what this uh kind of intensive uh, animal husbandry is one of the key requirements in this regulation is limitation of the volume uh of uh, manure uh, of of um, nitrate in manure per uh, square surface of uh, land. Uh, what is new in this regulation? Uh, you, you, it's similar. Uh, 
we, we can say that we can remember that uh, all the microorganisms uh, can be mentioned. A lot of microorganisms can be mentioned for improving the quality and fertility of soil, but they are not mentioned here. We have uh, a provision which uh, says microorganisms are allowed to be used, are allowed for use. And uh, there are certain criteria which are quite broad, uh, improving uh, availability of certain components of the soil and so on. In fact, we are talking about the whole range of uh, beneficial microorganisms to be used for uh, all kinds of uh, co complexes. As for compost activation, plant-based uh, uh, preparations are uh, allowed for use. Now it's official. Biodynamic preparations are also allowed. Vitali said that we will have other topics for uh, brought up for discussion later. Uh, this way or another, they uh, they are now allowed in the regulation. What's forbidden is uh, nitrite uh, for based fertilizers, uh, mineral fertilizers, uh, any other mineral fertilizers as well. As for allowed products, we have certain criteria. Uh, which are not always easily satisfied. So we have to be really careful with the regulation um, coverage. Uh, now we have this uh, regulation, EU regulation 2021-1165, uh, where we can find substances and uh, 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 compounds that are allowed for use. Uh, among other things, for fertilizers, we can have this uh, list. You can find it on the screen. Blood meal, hoof meal, horn meal, gold meal, um, fish meal, uh, feather, hair and skin meal, wool, fur, hair, dairy products. Uh, for all of these components, uh, you have to have uh, test results for chromium-6. These uh, substances can be used as elements for hydrolyzed uh, proteins that could be used as additional uh, nitrate fertilizer. Why additional is because the, the key source of uh, nitrate is uh, microorganisms in soil. In order to have uh, fertile soil, uh, we have to focus on the primary uh, s source. Uh, we can do it for the plants or with a short life cycle. And this will, could lead to improving, increasing the content, the protein content in durum uh, wheats. We could use uh, plant-based proteins. They are really similar to animal-based because they have a very similar structure of amino acids, uh, peptides, except for their property, uh, they, they, their origin, their content is very similar. Uh, Leonardite, uh, xylite uh, are uh, the elements that uh, can be used as soil conditioners to improve physical properties of soil especially on uh, soils with high clay content or sand content. Silite um, is common uh, where I now live. It could be used to substitute peat. 
speed has its own limitations for use uh, i mean in uh, horticulture in uh, growing uh, fruit and berries uh, in other with other cro uh, cro uh, crops we can use silite on the one hand it improves physical properties of uh, substrates on the other hand uh, it improves also chemical aspects of uh, soil and silite is an alternative for peat they are both uh, non-renewable uh, but leonardite and uh, silite are byproducts of uh, brown coal mining uh, subpropyl are uh, is applied to the soil to increase soil organic matter and as a fertilizer uh, uh, suppropel and uh, composite or fermented mixture of household waste uh, have a high risk of heavy metal contamination compared to other fertilizers uh, that's why they have the de uh, detailed criteria for heavy metal uh, testing before use as for calcium there is quite a wide list and a long list and nature really gave us a big present but these uh, the products uh, of calcium are those which are not uh, 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 restorable and uh, this uh, is the carbonate of magnesium and calcium and it is possible to substitute them by uh, the uh, lime defecate from the sugar production and also the uh, uh, residue of uh, the production of the salt and uh, also the eggshells and uh, there are criteria and they should not be from industrial production. And for Ukraine, it's a difficulty at present. And also during the occupation of the Sea of Azov, actually there was a lot of, uh, uh, of shrimp which have been processed at the high level. And uh, these residues were used as the source of calcium and uh, the source of hitinasm. Um, it could be used. Uh, definitely, this group of uh, substances is, is used to regulate of the pH of the soil and also as uh, the fertilizer and additionally as a source of calcium. But now, uh, well, it could could be used uh, the uh, uh, solution of the uh, calcium chlor. But the products uh, of the plant origin and uh, those, well, in the uh, the way they have been provided to us by by uh, nature, it was sawdust and wood chips uh, and the straw. Uh, those are the residues of plants and we leave them in uh, the fields. Uh, and also those which have been processed, uh, these those which have uh, been uh, thermally processed, uh, and mostly these are potassium uh, fertilizers. Uh, with uh, uh, a, a component of the alkali environment. And uh, they are being processed without uh, the oxide, uh, uh, oxygen. And uh, it has a very wide sphere of implementation. And it improves the biology of the soil, improves the content of natri natrium, and improves the chemical physical uh, properties uh, of uh, the soil, it fixes the nitrite, nitrites. Uh, and uh, if, for example, we can compare it to helatin, the micro agent of uh, the micro elements, and be it chart works the same way. Actually, it holds the nitrites in the environment, in the area where there is the access uh, of uh, plants. But at the same time, uh, uh, well, it uh, has. Uh, uh, the, the amount uh, depends uh, on the soils, on the temperature, which fluctuates, but it's very important to know that introduction it into the soil means that they are going to stay there for hundreds of years. In the South America, actually, the soils, uh, terra preta, are uh, created uh, by using the biochar. On the other hand, uh, 
the products, plant products uh, of plant origin could be composted and fermented. And uh, there is an advice, uh, and there is uh, even the requirement of the organic regulation that organic materials are to be composted, uh, and uh, then they are more accessible for the soil and uh, in the future for the plants. And uh, this is the composted bar, composted and fermented mixture of vegetable matter and biogas uh, digestate. And definitely the composition of the components uh, for preparing the digestate is quite wide. They could be both of plant and animal origin. And again, there are certain criteria of getting those, but the certification body always um, uh, will tell us whether it is allowed or not uh, while uh, assessing them. And byproducts of other processes, uh, this is stillage and still and extract, uh, except for the ammonium stillage and the minerals. Uh, well, uh, and the list is quite wide and uh, the list of the allowed minerals uh, is quite long and they should not be, uh, they should be in unchanged form. Uh, well, with the exception of the magnesium and the potassium sulfate, but the uh, calcium sulfate is the product of processing of sugar beet could be used. And uh, in this case, uh, it is as a component for other uh, agrarian production. And uh, the source of phosphorus uh, in organic, uh, well, it's a phosphorite, uh, meal actually and phosphate uh, aluminum calcium and uh, each of them can be used only in a certain groups of the soil with a certain acidity and phosphorite uh, meal uh, well depends uh, on the ph of the soils and phosphate of aluminum and calcium is used for the alkali soils exclusively and also it is allowed uh, since three or four years ago, the amino acids have been allowed and the practice of organic farmers have pushed to the fact that certain components uh, have to be added to the organic regulations. And uh, quite widely, uh, the products uh, from the seaweeds are pre well presented in Ukraine, and mostly those are imported. But we will have an opportunity, maybe in after we win, to use our own production of the algae. And certain producers wanted to do it. Also, mushroom cultivate wastes and the digit of worms. And the inputs or the raw materials for developing them is limited by the lists which has been enumerated a four, everything which has been included into annex number two. And uh, if this is the manure, then, then definitely if, uh, if these are plant components, well, and it was, it had to be mentioned about uh, the wood products, there should be, uh, should be assurance that the timber was not chemically uh, processed. And micro elements, uh, this is uh, maybe the only group of non-organic synthetic. They are natural, but nevertheless, they are man-made uh, uh, materials. Uh, this is the bore and uh, six micro elements, bore, cobalt, uh, 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 iron, manganese, uh, and zinc, uh, and uh, uh, with the exception of the molybden, these are the uh, uh, co compounds of these metals. Whether they are going to be substituted, most probably not. But uh, usually the amounts which are introduced into the soil are very small, and most probably they are going to be kept on the list of the allowed elements for the agricultural production and organic production. But maybe there could be some ele uh, uh, some. Uh, uh, limitations of the halate agents. Uh, like, uh, well, if we are talking about the private standards, it is uh, disallowed to be used, but uh, PDF as a halate agent is not allowed. And it can be, 
considered as the residue of the pesticides. And as for the list of the ELAT agents, well, most probably there's going to be a revision in the nearest future. And the final stage, this is the Annex 6 to the new regulations, maybe. This is an annex where the products and the substances uh, which could get a special uh, permission to use uh, them outside the European Union countries. And we are in this area, and at present we have submitted uh, our proposals and the list uh, to the review of the European Commission as for the list of the plant protection substances, because the situation with the fertilizers is more or less understandable. And uh, uh, there are certain limitations to use uh, certain kinds of microorganisms uh, to improve the process of composting or introducing them into the soil. There are no regulations and limitations as distinct from the pesticides. But if there are certain substances uh, or practices which are to be uh, changed and uh, there is a need in certain regions that are their own practices which are not taken into account in other regions. It is possible to submit the request to European Commission on behalf of the member state and this works through the certification bodies in our case and through the uh, uh, amalgamated bodies of certification. The Commission applies to the group of experts, technical consultants uh, on the organic production and this group is called ECTOP and the results of the research are being reported on and, and no matter whether the results are positive or negative they submit them and the positive decisions can be added to this annex and this is some sort of a window of opportunity for the uh, substances which are not allowed uh, uh, oh, well, which are not included into the Annex 2 as fertilizers or other substances which are necessary. And that the, with this, I would like to thank you for your attention. And if you have any questions, I will try to answer them. Uh, Mr. Ivan, uh, there was a question. Uh, the question was, what do you mean uh, when you are saying about the condition of the uh, of the soil meliorants uh, in Ukrainian, the soil improving substances? We do not have such a term in Ukrainian language. It has been borrowed together well with the notion from foreign languages. Uh, these are actually meliorants uh, of the physical nature and of the chemical nature. And uh, Svetlana is asking whether these norms are spelled out in Ukrainian language and everything which is allowed. Yes, in accordance with the law in Ukraine, uh, well, uh, we are certified, we are being certified in accordance with the law of Ukraine. And we are, all well, this list of all these substances has been included from the previous uh, regulation. And thanks God, the law of Ukraine and uh, the list of the uh, substances which are allowed in limited quantities uh, has been copied from the previous annex. So actually, there, were, there are no ch differences, no changes uh, to the previous list. Uh, and it copies uh, the previous uh, previous uh, annex and previous list. So we can use all these substances in Ukraine. Well, uh, well, but another story is the is with the you know large quantities whether the uh, producers will be able to find them. And uh, we we can find it on the site uh, on the uh, well, and there is a list of auxiliary. Yes, yes, uh, the list of auxiliary products, auxiliary substances. I have found it just now, and uh, I am going to um, send a reference into the chat. Yes, uh, the first. Uh, part covers uh, everything which is allowed by the standard and by the regulation and the second uh, part of it is the list of 2023 as of today we are already adapted uh, to and uh, we are going to prepare the list uh, uh, of 2024 by by christmas and uh, there will be the part of uh, the substances uh, and at present, we are developing of the terms of reference uh, uh, on the platform Organic Tech. So we are trying to update 
and uh, this is in an electronic platform and you will get the updated uh, list and we are updating it once a year uh, so at uh, this platform you will see the updated list of all those substances uh, taking into account the uh, uh, the the certification and uh, like for example natural ones uh, it's like chips wood chips can i use the wood chips uh, if it is not certified because i don't know who is going to certify the ch wood chips or biochar which uh, since the beginning is a uh, is actually not natural it's artificial because i'm creating it myself although we with mikola big of aware buying the certified biochar but uh, most people create it on their own so uh, uh, well is it natural or actually what's the difference or, or what should be certified well first of all if you are producing it for yourself uh, so you have to take into account the fa the uh, origin and the raw material uh, is mentioned in the regulation. So this is the question to the wood chips. It should not be processed uh, by chemicals. I mean that uh, you might uh, take, take the uh, pallets which have been pr processed by the chemical reagents and thus in this case, uh, it will be not allowed or you can burn uh, these uh, uh, the various kinds of uh, uh, wood chip materials with the synthetic resins, uh, so it won't be allowed. But if you are told, well, if you if you are asking whether it is possible to get a certified wood chips, so you have to satisfy this requirements of the list, and you have to prove that uh, the this raw material uh, is uh, the timber which has not been processed by chemicals. Uh, this is the sufficient. Uh, condition uh, but as for the biochar this is a more difficult question because the biochar can be allowed in case if the total number of uh, aromatic uh, resins uh, uh, and uh, formulations uh, does not exceed certain criteria and here uh, there is a risk and there is a risk of uh, high content of certain natural substances, but uh, in accordance with the criteria of organic usage, it might be considered uh, inappropriate to use. So this borderline is very fine, and for various substances, there is their own borderlines. Uh, thank you, Ivan. So maybe we will... Uh, answer other questions at the end so that we can give the floor to the next speaker. Sorry for abusing your time, uh, well, but nevertheless. And yes, thank you. And the uh, my, Mr. Bikov is going to speak to us. He is the consultant on the organic production. He's going to talk about the nitrogen nutrition. Good afternoon. I am Mikola Bikov, and I have an honor to speak to you on the topic of nitrogen nutrition and organic production. It's a very complex topic, and it is being discussed a lot, and there are various uh, solutions. And uh, my uh, previous colleague who was speaking actually uh, built a bridge to this topic when oh, he was uh, telling us about the regulations. Uh, but. I would like to say that nitrogen is one of the most complex elements of our agriculture. And one of the aspects is about the following. This nitrogen cannot uh, be found in the mountains. It cannot be found in the minerals uh, and in some other uh, substances. But in most cases, it's in the air. So its natural status is uh, to be in the air. It's like gasified and 
and it always is uh, trying to escape to the air. So we have to tie it into the soil so that it will be available for the plants. In the air, we have 78% uh, of the nitrogen and uh, we can find it in three forms. Uh, it could be found as like molecules and also uh, there is like uh, ammonia and also nitrogen containing uh, gases emissions uh, from the factories and in these cases uh, we uh, mean nitrogen which is in the air it is possible uh, to extract it well if it is uh, connected with the microorganisms only the microorganisms can actually uh, tie it with the soil and where we can get uh, the nitrogen so so that uh, the yields uh, will uh, be increased in organic farming. Uh, we can be more flexible for that purpose. First of all, where do we take it? Where can we get it from? We, we, we always have uh, some uh, percentage of nitrogen in soil it could be either bound or free uh, we need to have a great uh, volume of available nitrogen one specificity it can be uh, it cannot be in the free form it, it is always bound that's why this soil complex uh, is quite an average uh, source of nitrogen. The next source is uh, green manure, so to say, or oh, uh, sorry, plant residues. These plant residues should be degraded uh, as soon as possible and uh, that would make nitrogen available for the next um, uh, for the following crop the best way is to uh, mix them with the soil one of uh, organic farming objectives is deg deg degradation of uh, plant residues. Uh, the next source is nitrogen fixing microorganisms. They are this middle um, link for us and that's why we need to increase the volume of such organisms. That would make our soil more biologically active. That's when you bring your soil to a lab and they do the testing and show how soon uh, the soil is going to generate uh, nitrate containing uh, substances. Next uh, source is green manure. They, uh, they are generating a certain amount of uh, green mass. Uh, we can use uh, leg legumes uh as, as a source of uh, this uh, manure this nitrogen is degradable and is uh, available next uh way to have more nitrogen is crop rotation with good crop rotation we will have enough nitrogen in the soil and the last one is of course fertilizers organic fertilizer these are the six sources six ways to have enough nitrogen uh, i really like this australian microbiologist a whole produced a number of um, preparations that uh, improve the quality of fertilizer the fertility of soils in New Zealand and Australia, which are quite poor in nitrogen. There is no problem with nitrogen, said Graham cites this uh, researcher. He says we have to improve the soil, we have to balance it, uh, chemical, biological and physical uh, properties. His second statement is we have to make the soil healthier, we have to keep working on uh, health of our soil and one 
of examples here is degradability of all the residues in your soil. Uh, it's an indicator because it means your soil contains a lot of uh, good microorganisms. A third statement of the researcher is feed the cow that lives in the ground. We have some bacteria there. You have to work with them with your um, uh, other microorganisms. Uh, you have uh, like fungi, you have to feed them this leaf cover is responsible for uh, carbohydrates, uh, for the root systems. So we have to make sure there is good leaf cover on the ground. Uh, what are his uh, guidelines or recommendations? You have to balance calcium and magnesium uh, ratio. We will have a separate webinar on this methodology, the ratio between these two elements is key. Uh, your soil must not be too compact and not too uh, sticky. It has to be live, like uh, cottage cheese. Uh, the second recommendation is to have enough available phosphorus in the soil. Phosphor, because phosphor is all, phosphorus is also necessary for uh, our soil cow, so to say. One point here, everyone in, involved in uh, soy production know that um, soy needs uh, molybdenum. It's like uh, milk for our microorganisms. In most cases, uh, we have deficit of uh, this element, molybden. That's a very important element. Cobalt uh, is also important. We have to remember uh, on top of that about iron. Uh, iron contributes to chloroplasts. Uh, health uh, and uh, if we see that our leaves of the plants are not green enough it means the root of this plant does not have enough nitrogen this is the formula of sam grace you can read his works he's very good uh, in uh, theory and practice now let's take a closer look at each of these six blocks this is a very well-known chart uh, of a soil expert. We can look at the general nitrogen in the soil. It's not always available, but we can see how much nitrogen is there. Plants cannot always take advantage of, the, of that nitrogen, but uh, we need to take care of that. This uh, this is where the soil conditioners come into play. They uh, can improve the quality of soil. We can use uh, compost or a peat to make soil uh, better uh, in terms of physical properties. Uh, plant residues uh, if you work with soils, you know how much um, nutrients are still there in these residues. In this chart, you can see uh, approximate content of various um, uh, of various uh, residues and the content of uh, nutrients. If we have good rate between uh, carbon and nitrogen, it should be 20 to 1, that's the best one. It enables plant residues to be degraded uh, most easily and smoothly. If this ratio is different, it would mean uh, soil nitrogen would be necessary for degrading, and it, that would lead to 
uh, soil nitrogen deficit. That's why we can uh, sow uh, not the early soy, but a later yielding soy. And the same is true for winter crops like wheat, uh, barley, uh, oats. We uh, harvest them in the middle of summer. We mix them and then we enable the residues to degrade. You can see this dynamics on this graph. You uh, can observe how uh, variable the nitrogen availability is. Whenever we introduce other materials where uh, C uh, and ratio are not balanced. It it leads to depletion of soil nitrogen. But then, due to uh, plant mass deg uh, degrading, uh, we uh, balance it out. Uh, as for crop protection, I, I always recall my friend uh, and colleague Vitali Ivanyuk, who said uh, uh, that binary crop rotation uh, with 50% of legumes would enable us to accumulate enough nitrogen. So most of the farmers use this principle. They use soya, soybeans, or uh, uh, green peas or other legumes that makes it possible for them to have easily degradable plant residues and have enough nitrogen in their soil. This is a, a good practical approach. Now, organic fertilizers, uh, Vitali uh, has a lot of uh, tables and details We are looking at uh, uh, manure, not compost, because manure can have different ratios and different contents, uh, unlike compost. We do not recommend uh, introducing manure. It has to be composted before introduction to the soil. Of course, it uh, the process uh, composting process has to be certified. You will have slightly less uh, volume, thirty to forty percent less volume of compost compared to manure, but it would be more concentrated and it ha it would have better availability. When we think about the volumes of compost. Uh, how much of it should we introduce? Uh, it's uh, uh, above 20 tons uh, you, normally. In this uh, presentation, uh, we normally have balanced production, uh, um, green manure, uh, perennial um, grasses and pl plants, and um, that's important. Uh, what do they do before after harvesting uh let's say sunflower seeds uh, they have some residues on the soil and they uh, after that they sow um, veg for example uh, the leftovers of sunflower seeds on uh, the ground they improve the soil uh, buckwheat vetch so that they can uh, so that they start having young seeds and they uh, process the soil with disk machine you can uh, take a look at this uh, technology they've been using it for over 50 years i guess they get very good uh, yields uh, with it. Nitrogen fixation by microorganisms. Um, we uh, all uh, know about azotobacter, uh, which are very well known. One of the following presentations uh, is going to cover uh, bacteria producing, spore producing bacteria, and they uh, fixate 
uh, nitrogen. It's better to use uh, well-known uh, strains and uh, it's not necessary to inoculate legumes. Uh, you can work with uh, cereal and other crops. It would improve uh, availability of nitrogen. Mechanical tilling or uh, tillage of soil. Next Thursday, we are going to talk about technology for mechanical tillage of soil. We need to uh, suppress weeds and uh, we have to accumulate moisture in in the in the soil because it's necessary among other things for bacteria right this moisture is necessary for uh, improving availability of compost we have to always uh, try and ensure our soil is permeated with um, air uh, we need to avoid conflict be between uh, aerobic and anaerobic bacteria. This could um, improve the uh, availability of nitrogen for bacteria. So when we uh, mix soil, the, uh, the degrading uh, decomposition uh, takes place uh, with a better rate. It, it moves on uh, quicker. Now let, let's have a closer look at what we need to do. We need to increase uh, use of nitrogen. How can we do that? With the help of legumes, microbiological products, and mechanical tillage. Uh, we need to take this soil, take advantage of the components of the soil. Now, uh, we, let's say we need to preserve this nitrogen. That's what our farmers say. Can Canadians say that green manure is some kind of preserve uh, things we preserve for later, like in jars. Uh, the plant residues uh, decompose gradually. Then we add compost mass. We understand that it's not going to be available momentarily. Uh, we know that it's uh, distributed um, uh, through th the years, uh, like three years after introduction of or applying it to the soil. Uh, excuse me, someone uh, said something. And sowing green manure crops. Now, uh, let me give you this example of uh, a, a farmer who uses 50% uh, for legumes. And you see the proportion of... Uh, nitrate uh, nitrogen four milligram for uh 100 grams whereas for other farmers it's uh point 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 zero nine this is a potentially nitrogen that is uh formed in uh soil he doesn't use any organic fertilizers he doesn't use any other techniques. He just uh, sows green manure crops and he uses uh, legumes, up to 60% of legumes. Now look at this machine introducing um, the, the compounds. This is in Odessa region. Uh, now they have very good uh, uh, harvesting uh, results you uh, can take a look at our materials on our website they are both in english and in ukrainian you can uh, get a lot of useful information um, through the these files i'm sorry i'm a bit too uh, lengthy with my presentation no no it's okay uh, we will have a q a session later now, 
uh, we have the next presentation, uh, soil improvement, nitrogen fixation, phosphor mobilization, Johnson's compost. It's going to be delivered by Nicolas Lefebvre, who uh, has a, a bachelor's degree in rural engineering, who is an agronomist, expert for organic cultivation, and uh, who is uh, working at Research Institute of Organic Agriculture, Feeble, Switzerland. He works at the Department of uh, International Cooperation of Feeble and works in uh, procurement and uh, production of in Eastern Europe. Nastya, is Nicola going to share his presentation from his own computer? Yes, that was the plan. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Так, 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 чую. Yes, we can hear you. Uh, так, вот. Okay. Uh, I'm sharing my screen. Okay, does it work? Uh, Nicola, please share um Ukrainian version of your presentation. Yes, it's Ukrainian version on my screen. Yes, we can see that and I'm also demonstrating your English version of the presentation in a second. It's all good. You can start, please. Okay. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Nicolas Lefebvre. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, I'm uh, speaking to you from uh, Switzerland, from the Fiebel uh, Institute for Research in, Org in Organic Agriculture. Uh, we are going to uh, discuss a little bit about soil improvement, mainly uh, nitrogen fixation, phosphor, phosphor mobilization, and uh, Johnson compost. Today, I would like to uh, present you about uh, first on nitrogen fixation, something a little bit um, uh, complementary uh, to uh, my colleagues, which uh, were speaking before and, and, and who will speak after. I would like to emphasize a little bit more about um, the maximization of uh, the effect of cover crops. Uh, I would like also to talk about uh, the effect of uh, uh, semi-permanent cover crop, which are called uh, lays uh, in English, and uh, also intercropping, how to uh, integrate um, uh, legumes into a grain uh, rotation. About phosphor mobilization, uh, I will shortly talk about the difference between available and total uh, phosphor, uh, phosphorus available, and how to enhance uh, the availability of, of phosphorus in the, soil, in the soil, which is usually quite critical in, uh, in organic. And the last uh, chapter uh, regarding Johnson compost, brief insights on, on the production, uh, what are the different uses of uh, this uh, this type of compost? And uh, I will, uh, at the end, present a very few um, results of this technique. Um, a few words about Fibel. Fibel is a research institute uh, born in Switzerland 50 years ago. Um, and uh, from the very beginning, Fibel uh, aimed at uh, finding so practical solution um, practical solution for organic Swiss farmers at the beginning. And then uh, we uh, developed the Institute uh, with uh, several different research departments, um, uh, tackling and, uh, and answering to, to issues of organic uh, anywhere in the world, from India to Africa to uh, Latin America. But uh, the, uh, the original aim uh, of, of FIBEL has always been uh, to answer um, to farmers' problem first, and not science for science. Today, uh, Fibel uh, counts six different offices. Uh, the main uh, the main office is still in Switzerland, but we also have uh, colleagues in in Germany, Austria, but also in Hungary, and uh, an office in Brussels, which is uh, um, let's say a kind of a lobbying office and an advisory office. Uh, close to the European community. I am myself working in the international department, uh, which is not a research department, but uh, more uh, as an, uh, we are working more as a consultant and extensionist. Um, my role 
example, is to work in the uh, market and, uh, and sector development uh, with several projects abroad, mainly in Eastern Europe, uh, as you mentioned it already, but also a little bit in, uh, in uh, Africa. Uh, and uh, more personally, my uh, background is agronomist. I've been working uh, for more than 20 years in Europe, uh, mainly in um, Poland and uh, Romania. I used to manage a 1,600 hectare organic farm or arable farm in Western Romania for uh, more than 10 years. Uh, I'm also advising and lecturer for uh, organic um, on organic farming topics. And now for almost three years, I'm working uh, at Feeble, mainly on uh, Eastern Europe uh, projects. So back to um, our uh, today's topic. Uh, and we will start with this chapter regarding uh, nitrogen fixation in organic farming. And uh, let's see, uh, let's discuss about how to maximize the effect of the cover crop and other kind of uh, plants in the rotation. How to maximize this, uh, let's say, seasonal cover crop, which are uh, the, the short-term cover crop, uh, which are seeded for uh, a few months only, uh, in comparison with the, the perennial or semi-perennial uh, plants. Um, the nutrition roles of the cover crop uh, are, uh, can, can be um, um, represented through four different functions. First, uh, a function of production. That's the one we know from, from the legumes. Uh, so catching uh, this nitrogen from, from the air. Uh, nitrogen capture uh, to avoid uh, the leaching of the soil uh, nitrogen into a deeper layer. So catching what is already uh, um, in the soil. Um, also bringing other elements into um, organic form. That means that the, the plants will take some phosphorus, uh, potassium, and all other micronutrients uh, in their tissues, and they will release it under organic, um, organic form. And then uh, catching is, is important, but uh, it is nothing for, the, for our crops if these uh, cover crop cannot restitute all these nutrients. So it's very also important uh, that the cover crop have the ability of quickly restitute um, and, and, and give back uh, all these nutrients. So an effective cover crop must uh, accomplish these four functions, uh, catching uh, the leaching nutrients, producing nitrogen from the air, from the atmosphere, um, and uh, release a maximum, um, catching, sorry, um, um, as much uh, other nutrients as possible, and then release um, all these nutrients quickly for the following crops. So how can we maximize the uh, the, the efficiency of this cover crop? Because we have seen it. I'm, I'm glad to see a very nice experience in Ukraine already. Uh, this is one of the cover crop is one of the main um, tool that we have in uh, in our uh, organic toolbox um, to um, improve nitrogen content and other nutrient content uh, in the soil. So first, uh, a few rules, uh, it, is, it is exhaustive, but this is a few term rules uh, to maximize the, the effect of this cover crop. Uh, just don't rely on one single species. Uh, try to blend um, at least five to six different species in the, in the cover crop. Uh, don't rely also only on uh, legumes because uh, legumes are not the best one to catch the, the leaching uh, nitrogen, which is already present in the soil. So usually a good mixture will, will have two to three different uh, legume crop, like uh, veg, peas, uh, latirus, uh, chickling peas, whatever. But also at least uh, one um, nice catching, uh, great catching um, species like crucifera, uh, even rapeseeds, uh, let's say rapeseed volunteers are excellent at that, mustard, uh, radish, all uh, these crucifera are the best one uh, to um, catch leaching um, uh, nitrogen. Uh, make sure also that you have everything uh, to um, uh, everything uh, that is needed for your legumes to grow, meaning sulfur in the soil, but also even uh, the right um, rhizobium, 
uh, I, I was in uh, in Serbia last week and I saw uh, very strangely in, in very nice black soil um, some green beans, uh, garden green beans, which are really struggling with 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 their growth because uh, actually the rhizobium, natural rhizobium of the of the green beans was was not present in the soil. So um, yeah, check um, check the presence of, of the good rhizobium. Um, eventually, add it uh, to the to the mix. Um, one other rule is to plant so as soon as possible. Hello, I have something in my in my here. Um, Plant as soon as possible the cover crop, so right after the right after the harvest. Sorry, I have some sound in my in my headphone. Yes, Michael, I'm sorry. This is technical. This is a technical problem. They are now going to fix it. You, okay. you 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 hear the translation i can continue or um no just stay just for for a little okay. bit так так вот сейчас на украинский канал вас чудно так але не повинен я не повинен себе чути і николай не повинен мені чути так а зараз Um, can you, uh, was it okay just a moment ago? We were checking the Ukrainian channel. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. uh, uh, stay on a little bit. I will okay. tell a few words and you will tell us whether it's okay or not. Was it okay now, Nikolai? A yeah, I, I, I haven't uh -huh. heard anything. Yeah. Okay. Oh, good, good. All clear. Да, да. Давайте продолжать, потому что вот украинский канал, да. So let us start. Let us start. Okay. I go on. Uh, yes. Um, so as I said, the volunteers uh, after harvest can also do the job. Uh, after canola, for example, use the volunteers of canola to catch the nitrogen and just add uh, a few legume uh, species in the mix. Um, cereals also can also catch the, this nitrogen. Volunteers of peas are excellent as a cover crop. So just after, if you are growing some winter or spring peas, what is Growing up after harvest can also be used as, as a cover crop, maybe added with uh, a few other varieties. And uh, quite important is the management, the way you will terminate the cover crop. We have seen with uh, Mr. Bikoff uh, just before that the C per N uh, ratio is, is quite important in uh, the release of nitrogen. Don't wait too late until you terminate the nitrogen, uh, you terminate the cover crop, sorry. Um, the best ratio and the best ratio between uh, CNN and biomass production uh, will be obtained when uh, the cover crops start to bloom. From the blooming, um, the, the content of nitrogen regarding the content of, of carbon will decrease uh, in the plants. So the best moment to, to terminate um, the cover crop in order to have the nitrogen as fast, uh, uh, as quick available as possible is when you start seeing some flowers in the in the cover crops so on, on the on the legumes um another um, type of cover crop is the semi-permanent lay uh, it's uh, usually um, semi-permanent uh, pasture of clover or alfalfa depending on on, on the ph uh, there are many advantage uh, like um, resetting the weed stock um, situation. So after two years of well-managed uh, lay, uh, the weed stock will very will be very depleted. Uh, you also reshape all the soil structure thanks to all these uh, deep and, and strong uh, roots of alfalfa and, and clover. You will really restructure the the soil. Uh, you um, of course reload the soil with a lot of uh, nitrogen. Uh, may, maybe 200, 300 kilogram of nitrogen per hectare after two years, depending on the species, depending on, on the management, but, but the quantity is huge. Uh, you all, But you also, like uh, I mentioned uh, in, in the four roles of the cover crop, 
you will also bring up high level of, of phosphorus and potash on the topsoil, uh, thanks to the deep roots of alfalfa and clover that are going to mine um, these phosphorus and, 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 and potassium and other micronutrients in, in deeper layer than uh, um, annual crop uh, could do. So um, a few rules about these, um, um, these semi-permanent lay. Uh, try to promote a quick establishment, depending on the weather. Uh, usually, uh, establish, es establishing them in Ukrainian um, uh, context, it's better to, to seed them in September uh, because you will avoid a lot of weeds if you are seeding in the in the spring. Uh, these uh, clover and alfalfa, they are usually very tiny plants at the beginning. And in spring, you uh, you always have this flush of weeds, of, of spring uh, weeds. So the best way is to, uh, if uh, weather uh, allows, to seed them in, in September. If not, uh, seeding in under cereal is possible and, and works, but only if uh, you seed. Uh, and not spread it like you see this picture on on the uh, on the top. This uh, cedar in the wheat, the wheat is not suffering at all at this stage from uh, the cedar operation. But then you have the advantage of having this clover or alfalfa already established at the harvest, uh, and uh, also the wheat is is uh, or the or any other cereal is um, kind of covering a little bit the soil, and then you. Um, you uh, avoid having too many weeds also in your cover al alfalfa. So um, planting it into into cereal that way is is really feasible and and uh, and uh, and quite successful. Uh, once you have your lays uh, established, um, the most important is the, the management. If you want to have this uh, weed depletion uh, effect, you really have to manage properly the lay, meaning cutting. Uh, as much as necessary, and uh, the cutting starts at uh, the first floor you see again, uh, because from the first floor of clover or alfalfa, the biomass production is uh, is decreasing. You you reach a kind of uh, plateau, um, and if you really want to increase to maximize the biomass you produce per year, um, then you have to cut it once the the first floor uh, appears. Choose alfalfa for basic pH. This is this is something you know already. And uh, clover, if you want to maximize uh, the biomass, choose some red clover or tetraploid red clover, more precisely, which are really producing from the first year a, a huge amount of, of biomass. Other ways to introduce legumes uh, in the rotation uh, besides this uh, semi-permanent lay or the seasonal cover crop. Uh, other ways would be uh, to use microbes. We have seen a very nice example with Mr. Bikov uh, just before. So this is a mix between uh, legumes and cereals, or might be also legumes and, and, and linseeds, or legume and uh, crucifer. There's a lot of uh, available uh, possibilities. Seed rates, they have to be uh, adapted to, to your country. But um, we are only in the beginning of, of these uh, uh, crop mixes. And uh, really, I used to say imagination is the, is the limit. I, always, I also have seen some mixes of two legumes, uh, two different legumes as a cash crop, uh, which are working very well. So this is one of the possibility. The permanent cover uh, you see uh, on the bottom left, the combine, uh, the picture with the combine. This is um, a permanent clover uh, which has been uh, seeded with uh, winter oats uh, on top of it. So this is a cereal cultivated into living cover crop. So the, the clover will stay for years. Uh, this is in this case white clover, white dwarf clover. And the cereal can be repeated a few years, and uh, in the same times you you keep building the the nitrogen stock and the, the fertility uh, of the soil. One last option, which is a little bit more uh, precise and and technologic, let's say, is the the relay cropping. This is the combine on the right, the picture on bottom right with the combine. This is uh, the technology which aims at uh, planting a crop into a maturing uh, cereal. So in this case, not entering into details, uh, this is soybean uh, under wheat. So you see the combine is uh, uh, harvesting the wheat 
And underneath, you have already the, the young uh, soybean planted for six weeks already, and they are ready to explode thanks to uh, um, sunlight reaching the soil. Uh, let's speak a little bit about phosphomobilization uh, now in this second chapter. When we say um, phospho uh, mobilization, it's about it's the difference between um, the available phosphorus for the plants and the global stock. Uh, you see here, it's um, you, you have uh, on on analysis a uh, hundred times more phosphorus in your soil than the available phosphorus. So the the whole question is. How can we get into uh, this huge amount of uh, phosphorus? Even though on this analyze, uh, this is not a, a great example because the soil is quite poor. But even in in, in this poorest soil, you have uh, a huge difference between between what is available and what is um, blocked in the soil. So a few uh, different technologies, uh, but. I have to say, uh, from now, there is no uh, magic solution uh, at this moment regarding this, uh, this uh, phosphor mobilization. Uh, there are some specific commercial microorganisms uh, sold by, by many companies. Uh, you, you have the solution to enhance the rhizosphera, to make the, the rhizosphera around the roots uh, um, more let's say aggressive on on the phosphor uh you have these uh, mining effects of the of the cover crop and mainly on the, of the lace the semi permanent lace and uh finally some um, as said pea extracting plants plants which are uh, which are known um to um to mobilize uh, phosphorus but first thing first um phosphorus is available under certain condition in the soil, meaning uh, mainly the pH. Um, so before thinking about any um, more or less costly uh, um, solution, uh, I think uh, the first thing to do for farmers is to uh, adjust their pH if it's not in the right window between roughly six and eight, eight being very, very high, but at least over six, uh, to make sure that uh, most of the of the phosphor can be available, uh, the ideal starting with uh, 6.5 of pH. So this is maybe the first measure to uh, to apply and maybe one of the most efficient. Then uh, microorganism. I think we have um, a speaker afterward with, which will present a little bit more on on this technology. I'm personally. Uh, uh, not uh, an expert in in this field i'm i'm using more uh cover crop solutions but uh as far as uh, as we know at feeble there are no um let's say big proven effect of of this organism only because uh, um this is very complicated to accommodate uh, foreign bacteria, uh, foreign uh, microorganisms into any kind of soil. This is uh, already uh, very complicated to accommodate them uh, and to and to stay on a longer uh, period. But uh, bringing uh, these microorganisms in unknown and very different environments, meaning soil type and temperature, annual temperature and so on, this is uh, something which is very precise, very delicate, it, in which is not uh, always successful. And very difficult yeah, to, to, to find a one size fits all, meaning uh, maybe some bacteria and some products working in uh, Western Europe or, or other continent will not give any result in, in Ukraine, for example, because conditions are, are very different, meaning soil and, and, and climate mainly. Uh, the the rhizosphera um, enhancement. This is the Johnson compost that we will uh, speak a little bit on, on it uh, later on. This is uh, this Johnson's compost, uh, just to, to, to say that. That's a farm-made input, so at least it's almost free. Uh, it doesn't cost uh, uh, much uh, for farmers to, to try it and to try to, to adapt the, the recipe to, uh, to their condition. Uh, and um, the big advantage is that we will develop and use a local microorganism and microbiome. 
Some results we will see are quite encouraging. We will see it in the chapter number three. Uh, using the lace, uh, meaning clover and alfalfa on, on longer period, uh, is also uh, something which would give uh, results. Uh, because as I said already, uh, these uh, semi-perennial or perennial multi-annual crops, they have the capacity to uh, to dig deeper with the roots and to access uh, some uh, further stock and quantities of, of phosphorus, but also of uh, potassium and, and other micronutrients, and to bring them under uh, under the form of, of the uh, IAL biomass, to bring them on the topsoil. Uh, this is a small experiment I had uh, a few years ago in uh, Romania, but um, related to um, permanent cover crop and, uh, and cereals, I mean, uh, no-till cereals seeded in, in, in living cover crops. And I was performing uh, some some sample analysis of soil in in this uh, in this uh, field with or without cereal just to see if if i add a cereal to the system am i still building um the fertility in the soil the the answer was yes a slight uh, difference but still um if you look uh, quickly at the at the table uh before planting the alfalfa and then and then after 2 years of alfalfa alone uh, we had an increase of almost four, three times uh, the content of uh, phosphorus and uh, almost twice the, the potassium. Um, another uh, solution is the specific plants, uh, what we call the, um, um, the phosphorus mining plants somehow, like, like the buckwheat uh, and uh, phacelia. But regarding buckwheat, there are some uh, some um, studies made on the, on the subject, and uh, actually, the buckwheat can mobilize uh, very um, stable phosphorus, for example, from the phosphate nat phosphate natural rock. Um, but buckwheat cannot find phosphorus where there are, there is not, so. Um, it can mobilize phosphorus when the concentration of the, let's say, stable phosphorus in the soil is, is quite, uh, it's middle to, to high. And um, the fact with uh, buckwheat is that this is a plant which uh, enjoys um, a luxury consumption of, of phosphorus. So the more it has, the more it's, it's, it's taking, even if it's not needed for its um, internal biomes and, and for, um, for its for its own growth, so it it will consume much more phosphorus that that it um, uh, needs, but keeping it in the in the biomass and and restituting it under uh, organic form. So the the study you see on the right, it's uh, yeah you have the link there. Uh, it just shows that um, phosphorus in presence of uh, uh, rock phosphate will consume uh, and and retain much more. Uh, we will have actually will have the uh, the buckwheat will have the capacity to extract this uh, phosphorus from the phosphorus natural uh, rock and keep it in this its tissues much more than maize for example that that was the aim of the of the study uh, and now the last uh, chapter regarding Johnson compost I think this is uh, this is a technology that some of you has uh, already used or, or tried um, this is uh, something quite encouraging uh, because uh, personally, I really like the solution which are farm made and which uh, doesn't cost almost anything to farmers, but a little bit of, of labor and uh, and attention. Um, first, about the production, this is uh, mainly about the right mix uh, because afterward the, the, the compost is, is working by itself. So. The good in the good uh, infrastructure, meaning uh, something made by yourself or this box, which is uh, uh, sold already uh, in, in in Europe, a little bit more, um, uh, let's say, uh, accurate and with with uh, some uh, assistance. But it uh, this compost can already be made uh, by by yourself with very simple, uh, very simple material. The right mix is really important, uh, meaning a third of manure, a third of, of green waste like leaves or grass, and a third of, of wood chips, not uh, too big also. Uh, for a very first batch, uh, what is um, usually said is that um, farmers or, or composters will try to, to gather uh, the native 
microbiome, native grounds around the farm, so not in the field, but what is around in, in the old forest or native prairies, native, native pasture. Uh, collecting a little bit of humus here and there will help uh, to reestablish um, the native microbiome into this compost and thus uh, afterward in the, in the fields. So this is a, a process, a quite long process, but uh, where you just have to monitor the, the moisture and the temperature, not to be uh, too low during the winter, but uh, there is no turning of the compost. So this is a very uh, easy process. And this process can take nine to nine months to one year. So you have to, uh, yeah, you have to be organized in order to, to use it within a year and you have to, to have a, a kind of production production schedule uh, to, uh, to ensure the, the quantity that you, that you need. So the different uses uh, of this uh, of this compost are uh, direct application, so just spreading this compost on the field. But when you see um, the, the amount needed and uh, for, for uh, larger arable crops and uh, the infrastructure needed for one uh, cubic meter, uh, this is not always the best solution, or the, it is not always the the best use you can do. Uh, from it. Uh, that's a good use for horticultural, for production of seedlings or whatever, anything in, in very small areas, uh, vegetable production, greenhouses and so on. But uh, for arable crops, we will uh, prefer to use, uh, uh, to use it as a compost extract. So extracting, uh, making a kind of tea out of this compost, extracting the liquids, uh, and spraying it on wet soil or, or in uh, rainy conditions to make sure that the microorganism can survive and enter the soil. Or uh, more recently, furrow application. Uh, most of the modern cedar, they have these, these options of, uh, this option of uh, injecting, uh, for conventional, it's injecting um, starter uh, liquid fertilizer. This same equipment can be used to inject um, compost extract uh, to just simply uh, to simplify um, the manutention and to simplify uh, the process regarding uh, compared to the seed coating, seed coating being the the third option. This is the the picture you see. Um, that's um, a farmer, a fellow of mine in, in farmer in in Belgium, which is uh, now coating everything, every semens, every seeds uh, is using, being a cash crop or even cover crop. Um, so this is a mix of um, compost, compost extract, molas, and milk, uh, which aims at uh, feeding the, the microbiome. Uh, a few um, results. Some trials are still ongoing in, in Belgium and, and Germany, as far as I know, but I'm pretty sure they are uh, at farm level. They are, they are uh, trials um, in every country in, uh, in Europe. Uh, the the few results I, I had uh, I have seen already shows 15% more. This is in conventional 15% more uh, yields in wheat regarding um, uh, seed coating with fungicide. So it's not equivalent to uh, fungicide uh, seed treatment, but it's even more productive. But the most important for me is uh, is not yet explained, but um, the ratio of uh, nitrogen. I mean the nitrogen efficiency with this kind of seed is much higher. Uh, this is 15 uh, kilograms of nitrogen needed for one ton of, uh, for one ton of uh, wheat. Sorry, there is a, there is a mistake in the, in the text. So it's, the ratio is 15 kilograms of nitrogen for one ton of wheat, when in very conventional uh, production and high uh, productive region, the ratio is almost three. So much less nitrogen needed to produce one ton of wheat, which is, which is absolutely great. Um, and uh, the last um, um, conclusion of these first trials are that uh, testing uh, side by side furrow application and seed coating gives also more, almost the same results. So for larger area, uh, using the, the furrow application is much more uh, much easier than, than coating uh, big quantities of, uh, of seeds. So this was all for today. Um, a few take home message uh, out of my presentation. Uh, before adding new microbiomes, start with rebuilding or start to try to rebuild the native situation. You're just very short, we have been destroying this native uh, situation by heavy tillage, but mostly 
the use of chemical fertilizer, fungicide and insecticide. This is already proven. Uh, so the idea is that we have been, we don't know what we have destroyed. That, that's, that's basically as, as simple as that. But we have to reestablish um, taking uh, from, from native land, from native uh, ground, taking, taking what is still there, multiplying it and, and re-inoculating the, the soil. Uh, there are many farms available solutions and not, it's not always about costs of inputs. There's, these, uh, they are also almost uh, uh, free so, uh, solutions. Try to think green before gray. That's sometimes a problem with, with some um, highly equipped uh, farmers that they think that solutions are always in technology and in equipment, etc. Uh, solutions are first in the green. Solutions are first in this microbiome, in this cover crop, and, and the way we, we plant and we manage them. Um, I'm very sorry, but I have no silver bullet for you, uh, even more about uh, phosphorus. So no magic solution, but a lot of processes to, to maximize. Uh, nothing is simple in farming and, and, and organic uh, even more. Uh, and uh, finally, uh, I didn't highlight that, but regarding these um, uh, semi-permanent cover crop and cover crop and uh, and crops in general, try not to export anything from the field. Uh, so um, cultivating alfalfa or clover for one or two years or three years, uh, it's aimed at being uh, left on the soil mode merge on the soil and not exporting because you are uh, you are exporting your your nutrients so uh, at at uh, at best if you export just bring the equivalent in menu or even more but the idea is to try to import more in the field just gather everything you can outside the, the farm being um, uh, green uh, residues uh, urban compost uh, whatever and try to import only for Arab, arable farmers, export only grain and leave the rest on the fields. Um, this first webinar uh, I participated in is, is part of the uh, QFP, QFTP project. Uh, you may know that uh, Feeble and uh, Ukraine uh, are collaborating for um, more than uh, 15 years now. Uh, and this new phase of this uh, project collaboration is aimed at um, higher value added trade uh, to the organic and dairy sector in uh, Ukraine. Uh, mainly my colleagues Toralf and uh, Tobias are uh, managing and implementing this project. I'm here as a um, technical advisor, let's say senior advisor, and uh, I will have the pleasure to uh, share some time with you uh, next week on the next webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Nicola. We have some questions, so probably we take them right now. They say we have some issues with the animal husbandry, especially now uh, when there is ongoing war. Uh, we don't need, ha which means we don't have enough manure what's the best way to create high quality compost without manure animal uh, animal based manure um, maybe basing it only on plants what's what's your recommendation um still the same uh, the same ratio i mean uh, try to mix uh, green plants like like silage or uh, green plants uh, 30 to 40 percent uh, straw and wood chips. This is uh, replace the menu with, with uh, cereal straw, for example. But you have to keep uh, more or less this balance of, of three thirds. And at least a very few manure, uh, a, ve a very few uh, percent, let's say, of, of manure in the in the process to inoculate uh, the whole compost. If you cannot provide thirty percent of of, of the, the total volume, at least. Five to ten percent, maybe well, around five, is already good if it's well uh, um, distributed uh, in the compost. Just to start the the process of of composting. Mm, yeah, Thank you.
We had some questions probably for Ivan Havran or yeah, it was about uh, certification and regulation. We are going to take those questions later. Uh, if, uh, dear participants, if you have any questions for Nicola now, please ask them now. I'm, I'm just trying to look through the, uh, uh, the chat. Uh, alkaline nit nitrogen, is it, uh, I don't know for whom this question is. I, I will, Mikol, I will probably try and answer this question. That's the question. Uh, this is an interesting one. This is a method to identify nitrogen content. We uh, digrade uh, soil with other alkaline or acid, and we identify nitrogen structures in the content of soil. Uh, I don't know whether it's available only in alkaline hydrolyzed uh, soils. Uh, we just need to know that farmers who have uh, nitrate, both uh, nitrate and uh, alkaline hydrolyzed, hydrolyzed nitrogen uh, fields, they are similar. I saw different farms, both organic and not organic, and I saw different results depending on what kind of technologies they used. My, I, I Thank you. I have a question for Nicola. With extraction, this compost tea or liquid, when we create this biodynamic compost in big volumes, when we need to prepare ext extract, and then to inject it uh, into furrows or irrigate uh, the leaves. How do you do that when, when we talk about Johnson's compost? How do you extract uh, uh, from uh, Johnson's compost using aeration method? Can you give us some applicable, uh, actionable um, tips? when we work with big uh, area uh, surface areas mm -hmm. um one way is um to take this uh, cubic meter uh, container uh, without top uh half of the volume with compost half of the uh, filled with water so you have already one a thousand liter of of mix more or less you have to mix it uh, mechanically for minutes uh 10 20 minutes uh, at least uh, and then filtering it roughly depends how you use it. If you use it with the, the sprayer, then you have to, to filter it quite quite a lot. Or you can take out the filter out of all the, the system of the sprayer to just to not get stuck uh, with all the sprayer. Um, yeah, we use it. We, we use some um, uh, tissues uh, filter, not too fine because uh, we don't have to filter it at the, at the micron. Uh, but uh, it usually work work quite well with this uh, cubic uh, cubic uh, container, uh, cubic uh, cubic container, with the the valve on the on the, on the bottom. Uh, yeah, but the, the important is agitation, uh, very long time. Even even if you think it's already mixed, the agitation is um, uh, yeah, mechanic agitation very energetically. You really have to break all these small particles of compost and that everything enter in contact with, with water. I've been doing it for a uh, hundred hectares, but uh, maybe you have farmers of with thousands of hectares on there. It's just a question of scale, uh, but uh, I'm pretty sure farmers are good at inventing uh, uh, new processes. <laughs> Uh, I didn't understand. Then what is the time of aeration? You tell the 20, 40 minutes. Is that okay? Or we yeah. have to use, to spend hours to aerate it so that it will be extracted properly? No, no. 20, 20 let's say 20, 30 minutes. It's, uh, yeah, it really depends of, 
of the raw material of the compost. Some some raw material will give uh, uh, some more sticky and and some yeah some harder particles. Some are after nine months of composting are, are more soft and are more prone to to completely dissolve in water. So the idea is to not find anything left uh granules in the water everything has to be uh, completely let's say explodes no no more particles so it really it it is it, visual let's say it's uh, I, I can't say but it is not hours it's, it's not during hours it's yeah let's say maximum half an hour and you have all these things are uh, in suspension а там запитання в чатці ну в зв'язку з is there is a question of, in the chat due to the climate change in Europe. Uh, we can see that the warming process uh, is uh, going on. Maybe there are new cover crops uh, which are more efficient mm -hmm. than previously. Like, for example, we, uh, we actually grow a lot of rye to fight uh, mm -hmm. uh, the um, the weeds uh, and also phacelia and the mustard mm -hmm. and these are the major major cover crops but maybe there are something special due to the climate change maybe they will be more you know efficient uh, mm -hmm. maybe you have found uh, other uh, plants uh, which could serve as the green manure in europe i've been trying uh, a few of them uh mainly legumes and the problem with uh, exotic legumes is that we don't have the proper inoculum in the soil or even in commercial form. Uh, a few months ago, I've been trying a sun hemp, uh, Crotalaria, which is well known in Brazil and in all Latin America. Uh, unfortunately, uh, it wasn't the first time, but uh, one of my um, uh, farmer, let's say, uh, want, really wanted to try. And, and we, we he bought some, some seeds in Bulgaria. And um, I was looking for a specific inoculum. You can't find it. There, there, are, there is no commercial form of inoculum in, in Europe. So we planted it uh, and uh, the sunham grows at maybe 40 uh, centimeter high, but no nodules, no rhizobium present on the root. So it was like any other kind of, uh, of, uh, of plant, let's say, not, a, not this very lushy, powerful legume that we see on, on in in Latin America. So sun hemp, uh, yeah, yeah, it looks very nice on YouTube, but in, it doesn't really work in in uh, Europe. Uh, but uh, at the opposite, uh, maybe you use it already. Uh, what uh, English called uh, chickling peas, which is Latirus sativa. Uh, it's a kind of um, pea, let's say, with the seeds are quite square, like small cubes. And this is um, giving very good results. Um, uh, resistance to drought, resistance to, to our um, semi-continental Eastern uh, Europe climate, and uh, a very nice production of, of nitrogen. And uh, it's not host of much of the, the disease we have on, on other legume crops. So it's a, it's a quite good candidate, this Latirus sativa. And very easy also to produce on farm, to, to produce your, your own seeds. Я тогда открыл запитання. Да, 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 вологі. У нас сейчас недостача вологі, тому. Uh, well, uh, the humidity, humidity. Uh, very few people are sowing uh, the winter crops because there are a lot of rain. Is there any species which uh, uh, while the humidity is low, we can use as the cover crop or maybe we have to use the same legumes and the same traditional cover crops but we have to wait until it starts raining don't wait until it starts raining uh in summer you always do better as a seeding uh after harvest and uh what we found here in in, in europe because even in western europe uh, we we start to really struggle with planting anything in the summer uh, we also uh, we are also hit here in Central and, and, and Western Europe with, with, with this very long period uh, without rain. But regarding cover crop, uh, what is really true is that planting after combine, even if it's bone dry, will really will always work at the condition to plant deep, if not very deep. Five centimeters is not too much. That's uh, a very thumb rule. In the summer, you can plant 
any seed at five centimeter, even more when they are uh, mixed, uh, different uh, different species together, they will all, uh, once they get the enough uh, humidity, if, if it's really too dry, but they are waiting there for the rain, everyone, every seed will, will germinate and, and, and pop up. Uh, so five centimeter is the rule. And uh, the bigger the seeds, the the easier they will germinate because they have this intern, uh, this inside moisture uh, in them. So they need a little less, uh, let's say, moisture. And they are more prone to, cap to catch the moisture around. So the bigger the seeds, the more germination you have. So these chickling peas, for example, they are like like peas, and uh, yeah, and they can germinate with very few uh, moisture. But yeah, uh, just the last uh, condition. I, I, wasn't I, I didn't specify, but this is all. Uh, um, this is all uh, valid if you uh, if you are able to plant in 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 no till in wheat stubble without any kind of. Um, of tillage in the summer. Mm -hmm. Uh, thank you. Uh, the practitioner biodynamics, Ivan, is asking a question uh, whether uh, we are working in the organic farming and we are mostly introdu uh, introducing bacteria, fungi, and microorganisms. Are there any research about the fact that, that uh, this uh, sprayers? Uh, 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 well, uh, actually exercise some pressure and they might uh, might kill the fungi or these players uh, don't affect uh, the microorganisms, bacteria and fungi and when we are spraying the leaves with them. Uh, does it affect the bacteria or not? Very good question. Uh, I don't know if there are some studies, but uh, in some publication it is recommended um, somehow to uh, to make sure that in any part of the sprayer, the, the pressure doesn't exceed, I think it's 1.5 1, 1. bar. And this is not the final pressure you have uh, in the nozzle. This is on the wall, uh, um, in, in the wall machine, because in some part of the machine, you have the pressure regulation and so on. And in, at some points, the pressure can exceed uh, this. I don't have number on that. I, I, it was also one of my concerns when I was using it. And um, we decided to apply uh, this, um, the, the, the few trials I had, uh, we decided to apply with uh, the um, uh, nitro liquid nitrogen option. So these are uh, nozzles, which are not uh, making, um, um, they, are not, they are not spraying with high pressure. It's just some, some small um, droplet, let's say, specific nozzle for, for liquid nitrogen. And they are very low in pressure. This, this like uh, zero 0.5 uh, bar uh, at the nozzle. So meaning that the, the wall machine is working um, uh, very low. Yeah. But you're right, this is a concern. So so for people who want to inoculate with sprayer, uh, try to uh, minimize the pressure at, as, as much as possible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, cool. Well, thank you. And um, I would like to remind everyone that we have the translators till six o'clock. And we have one more speaker. We have more spe one more speaker, Yulia Mironova. And she is a researcher of the protection of plants, phytopathologies, phytopathologies, and uh, she is uh, a plant action researcher. And she would like to talk us about the mechanisms of nitrogen fixation and phosphate uh, potassium mobilization. Um, so then uh, we won't be able to ask Nicola the questions, uh, if are any, after the presentation. So, Yulia, please. Uh, let's uh, let us accelerate. Good afternoon. I will try to to be able to tell you within nine minutes uh, to tell you about uh, uh, how the fixation and potassium mobilization fixation take place and what are the factors which affect uh, the efficiency thereof. And it's very important. Uh, so if you are using the phosphor mobilizers and the nitrogen fixes, you will get uh, good results and not just waste your money on that. 
I will start from the simplest thing. So what is the composition of our soil? Because the soil is the basis of our uh, yields, and we have to pay attention to the composition of the soil. If we divide conditionally the soil, I'm not going to talk about all the components. There are lots of minerals and organic uh, components, but I'm going to talk about the basics. Uh, the basic uh, composition of uh, the soil, uh, uh, well, we have the organic part, uh, which uh, includes the humus and the mineral part. Uh, the organic part of soil, if, uh, well, it's 85% uh, consists of humus and 10% the residue of plants and 5% is the uh, flora and fauna of the soil. And there is a very interesting relationship. These 15%, uh, the, these are the residues of plants and microorganisms create the humus as such. So 85% of our organic component of our soil. So, if we are working efficiently with these 15%, we can get the better yield on, on, on our soil. And also, I'm talking here on this slide about the possibility to uh, break down the structure into gaseous, liquid, and the solid phase. This is about the mechanical conditions for growing plants, because if... Uh, uh, some of uh, these uh, uh, these components uh, will disappear from our soil, or the ratio will be changed. Well, for example, liquid phase uh, will be increased to 35 or 40. Then uh, the, we will have flooded. We will have uh, less gaseous phase, uh, and the plants uh, will decrease the yields, uh, and uh, they will be macerated. But if the solid phase is more than 50%, then the, uh, the, uh, uh, the soil will be too compact and they are not going to grow properly. They will be low and they will not create good root systems. And we have to pay attention to this as well. And it is very important in organic farming and uh, uh, the sources of uh, nitrogen, uh, potassium, and phosphor. Uh, it is uh, true that we can find them in the natural conditions and it is possible to work on it. The first source uh, of our nutrients uh, are the residue of plants, uh, which we need to, to keep uh, at the field where we have been working because they actually accumulate a lot of nutrients. And ideally, uh, they, they could be efficiently used as the destructors of stub, which give an opportunity to bring back the nutrients into the soil. These could be azotobacter bacteria. These are great uh, nitrogen fixers, uh, which fix uh, the atmosphere nitrogen from the air. And depending on the conditions, they can actually fix five to 50 kilos of nitrogen per hectare. And uh, uh, the, the rhizobia may be accumulating uh, bacteria uh, of the nitrogen. Uh, so they can fix 60 to 300 uh, kilograms per hectare uh, to fix the nitrogen. And uh, the phosphorus, uh, if we are talking about Ukrainian soils, uh, there is a lot of it up to 30-35% of phosphorus is in the organic form. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, thanks to the microorganisms, uh, this phosphorus uh, could be converted into the accessible form and the plant will get it. There is a lot of potassium in the Ukrainian soils. And again, this is the question of the correct work with this soil. And if we are looking at nitrogen, so it is very important to understand that nitrogen in the natural environment is being transformed and there is a cycle of transformation and it is not stopped. And we have to understand that we can understand the cycles of uh, fixation of the nitrogen as nitrification of desertrophias. And this is always a cycle and we cannot look at it as at uh, uh, separate elements. It is also Im important to understand that the whole cycle of nitrogen uh, happens due to the activities of the microorganisms and they are different in each cycle. 
and the a part of the cycle and uh, while uh, testing the uh, ground uh, we can understand uh, at which cycle uh, the problems emerge and we can uh, affect this cycle to make this uh, farm more efficient uh, live working with the nitrogen the first microorganisms which participate in this cycle of nitrogen uh, these are free living nitrogen fixers, the azotrophs, and uh, they are the first to capture the nitrogen from air and they transfer it into the soil and then uh, actually transform it into the ammonia. And, uh, and these microorganisms start the cycle, launch the cycle, and then others uh, uh, start working. You can see the list of the main microorganisms which participate in this cycle. And actually, these azotobacter species, they are used most often, and they are most available in the Ukrainian, in the Ukrainian soils. And you can see the list of bacteria. If we are talking about the azotobacter, so we can see that the, uh, there is a lot of it in the black soil, into the podzols, and the ideal conditions are the neutral acidity, and if uh, if pH is lower than 5.5, so then the number of uh, uh, azotobacter decreases by 16 to 36 percent, and uh, the uh, most uh, bad soils are the soils where the acidity is lower than five, and also it is influenced by various factors, uh, which are being described here on this slide. Like for example. Uh, if we are introducing mineral fertilizers, uh, this will uh, suppress uh, the activity of these bacteria and uh, they would fix less nitrogen uh, in the soil because they don't need it. And also it is uh, necessary to understand that, that uh, the micro elements uh, can uh, have uh, an impact, molybden and boron, and uh, if they they can decrease the cells of azotobacter. Also, development of azotobacter and fixation of the nitrogen thereof uh, depends on the number of the amount of phosphorus. If it's not sufficient, uh, the uh, nitrogen fixation is going to be lower, and also calcium can have an impact. Uh, it is necessary to nutrition of the azotobacter, and uh, if uh, it is insufficient, then this brings about uh, uh, vacuolization of the cells uh, and uh, they and they die. If we are talking about the temperature conditions, it develops quite well in our climate and the optimum temperature is 25, 28 degrees Celsius and the minimum temperature when it is officially starts working is 10 degrees Celsius and maximum is 35. If this temperature is higher or lower, then exotobacter is uh, uh, going into the status of cysta and they actually survive until these uh, adverse conditions uh, are improved and the conditions become uh, good for them. If we are talking about the acidity, well, they like the uh, the acidity of, of four and the maximum acidity in the soil should be eight. I am not going to talk a lot of it. We were talk, uh, we talked a lot about uh, the rhizobia a lot. In this case, we have to understand that in this particular case that they live in symbiosis with the plant and the most official fixation uh, 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 depends affect not only development of the bacteria, but development of the plant as well. On this slide, you can see the process of creation of the, uh, of the nodules. And you can see that they generate flavonoids. And when bacteria feels that is growing in the, con in the direction of this tissue of the plant, and that uh, actually produces a certain substance uh, which bring about uh, the Uh, and uh, the creation of the nodule starts, and we can see those on the plant. Uh, and uh, if the process of nitrogen fixation was successful and this nodule is working efficiently, we usually, when you break it, you will see inside it the red tissue, and uh, this 
the uh, the legume these leg chemoglobin uh, which participate in the nitrogen fixation so if this nodule is red so it means that the nitrogen fixation is efficient but if it is gray or green then nitrogen fixation is not being carried out efficiently to develop uh, the resodia uh, the humidity uh, is very important. Uh, we need at least 67-70% uh, uh, from uh, the humidity capacity of the soil uh, to start the process of formation of the nodules. The minimum humidity under which it is, a, it is possible to create the nodules is 16% of the full uh, uh, humid humidity capacity. And if there are more than 30 uh, kilograms of uh, uh, fertilizers that is being introduced, then the nodules might fail to be formed. Also, the amount of phosphorus is very important from the point of view of the biology of the plant. If the phosphorus is not sufficient, they usually the bacteria do not uh, uh, get into the root of the uh, plant. Also, magnium and molybden uh, deficiency might affect adversely uh, the formation of the nodules. And another factor is the deficit of boron, because then uh, the uh, vascular uh, formations are being formed and the bacteroid tissue is not being developed properly. And it doesn't work effectively and efficiently. And the temperature, the minimum temperature to, for nodules to be created is 10 degrees Celsius, maximum 30, and optimal temperature is uh, 15 degrees Celsius. And the acidity, the bacteria uh, usually require neutral acidity, minimum acidity is 5.2 and maximum 7.5. And this is everything I wanted to tell you about the nitrogen fixing microorganisms. But if we are talking about phosphorus and potassium mobilization, well, there are lots of various bacteria doing that. And the previous speakers talked a lot about, about uh, the uh, phosphorus and potassium. Where does it come from? So I'm not going to elaborate on that. And I would like to go over to the microorganisms which participate in mobilization of the phosphorus and potassium. Uh, because uh, these, uh, uh, this was not discussed uh, amply by the previous speakers. Uh, so what is it, how does it happen? A significant number of soil microorganism species, uh, both bacteria and uh, micromycetes, uh, and uh, uh, are capable of synthesizing a wide range of organic acids, uh, including and these acids actually split the uh, salts of uh, phosphorus. Uh, and they create in the future uh, the accessible uh, uh, com uh, 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 minerals which are diluted in water. They are not working as the nitrogen fixa fixators who are with the help of their bodies uh, 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 create these processes. But in this case, uh, the process takes place uh, at the expense of uh, of the, in the process of uh, life of this uh, uh, of these bacteria, and uh, thanks to their uh, proactive function, the nutrients are being split. If we are talking about the phosphorus, if we are talking about the potassium, the microorganisms also can split uh, the silicates, which are not uh, dilutable, which include potassium, and they also create the organic acids, which I mentioned before. And uh, in the mineral nutrition, the uh, enzymes can participate. Uh, the phytases and hydrochinase, silicase, silicase, the wide spectrum of various uh, uh, substances. 
which can uh, split potassium and uh, phosphorus. So what uh, bacteria can do that? Usually in uh, the industrial conditions, uh, the preparations are being developed at, at, at the, on the basis of Bacillus megatherium or Bacillus subtilis or Bacillus megagnosius. Sometimes uh, uh, the Bacillus antimilifortius are being used and Sintimonius floresis are being used because they have an ability to mobilize uh, phosphorus. So there is a wide spectrum of bacteria which are capable of growth quite efficiently and uh, develop uh, under the various conditions in the laboratories and plants and we can use them to 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 be introduced into the soil and they will work with our uh, soils if we are talking about the factors which are influencing them these uh, phosphor-mobilizing bacteria are more resilient to that nitrogen fixing, and it's easier to work with them, and uh, they survive under uh, more difficult conditions in the environment. Uh, I give an example, uh, the Panibatius polymix. So, uh, it is aerobic bacteria. Sometimes it's a facultative anaerobic organism, and apart from uh, being a mobilizer, mobilizer of phosphor and potassium, it can affix a nitrogen and it can live in the rhizospheric of the plants in the root system and it synthesizes various antibiotics, uh, uh, substances and they can work under the phytopathogens. So this bacteria uh, can be used to coat the seeds and we can protect uh, the root system and also to get additional fixation of the atmospheric nitrogen if it is uh, not uh, available in the environment uh, to a great de degree. And uh, the mobilization of phosphorus and uh, uh, and uh, potassium. And uh, it can also uh, synthesize uh, the hormones and uh, to stimulate our plant. And uh, we are increasing the yields. If we are taking into account the temperature conditions, the minimum temperature uh, is five degrees of Celsius, maximum 45, and optimal uh, temperature for its development is 29 degrees. So the condition for these microorganisms are quite uh, uh, fit into quite a uh, wide specter. If we are talking about the acidity, so the optimal is 6.8, 7.2, minimum 5.5, and the maximum is 8. So again, this is quite a wide spectrum of the conditions. The next microorganism is also very in interesting. It's a bacteria, Bacillus megaturinosis. It's an aproactive uh, phosphor mobilizer, and uh, it is positioned the, as a, a good uh, uh, phosphor mobilization bacteria, and it uh, transforms uh, the phosphorus into the uh, form which is available for the plants, and it uh, and uh, it also produces the substance which can create uh, phosphorus, and it produces biologically proactive substances as uh, the vitamins uh, B12, for example, and the various. Uh, the vitamins which support our plant, and it has a very sp uh, wide spectrum of uh, influence. And it is very difficult to find microorganisms which will have only one mechanism of uh, uh, action. They are usually comprehensively uh, 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 comprehensively affect uh, the situation in the in the soil. The minimum temperature is three degrees, maximum is 45, and optimal is 30. And we can find a lot of these microorganisms, and they are developing in a wide spectrum of conditions. Uh, the acidity is six, uh, the, uh, the optimal one for the majority of the bacteria. Also, also to mobilize phosphorus and calcium, uh, Bacillus mucegenosis is being uh, used. Uh, they can transform the insoluble phosphates into the available form for the plants and fix the atmospheric nitrogen. And in this case, this bacteria uh, is very resilient uh, to the adverse conditions of the environment. And it can live uh, e e even in the liquid nitrogen with the temperature of minus 196 uh, 
degrees of Celsius and 160 uh, degrees uh, of uh, plus of Celsius, and uh, uh, it is very resilient and it is uh, very good for using in the bio preparations. The temperature optimal uh, temperature for this microorganism is 29 degrees Celsius, and the minimum is five, and the uh, maximum is 45. When I'm talking about the acidity and temperature, I mean uh, those which are needed to develop these macro in, uh, organisms, uh, the minimum and maximum. But in reality, if um, these minimum temperatures and the acidity are not provided, these microorganisms, which we are talking about the bacteria of uh, Bacillus, uh, and they uh, actually uh, become the spores and they are being kept until the uh, uh, until the favorable conditions are going to be created. So now, well, they are getting into the status of the spores and they will start working uh, starting from spring. This is everything I wanted to tell you. Thank you for your attention. If you have questions, you can call me, you can write me to the uh, my email and uh, or you can use this qr code to get into my site and you will have the telephone numbers of our regional representatives in every oblast of ukraine and uh, also our foreign representatives co-working in various countries uh, of the world and are implementing biotechnologies and various types in various types of uh, uh, soils uh, given the various temperatures and uh, uh, acidity. Yeah, thank you. You you just fit your presentation into the desired time. Well, our English speaking channel is going to be disconnected now, and uh, still, I I would like to use five minutes to ask two questions. So, Anastasia, shall we complete uh, an English uh, translation? I wanted to talk to the two uh, producers of the preparations, bio preparations, and by the way, the question is about them. Be well, Ivan asked this question, and also I wanted to repeat it. Mikola Petrovich is here with us. He is a producer of the microbiological preparations, and Yulia is a representative of the center which uh, uh, they are also uh, developing metarhizium, techoderma, and do you have any, and fungi, do you have any requirements uh, uh, to the pressure of the sprinkles? Uh, because if we are introducing the uh, main uh, preparations, we usually are using the dripping system and not to destroy the microorganisms. But you, two producers uh, of uh, fungi, if uh, the, the, these are spores, we can understand it more or less, but if it is a living fungi, fungi do you have any research in terms of pressure and, uh, in the, under which uh, the fungi are not destroyed? We were not studying the question of uh, the pressure which affects the microorganism, but in the majority of cases, our uh, preparations are in spore form and uh, the pressure doesn't affect us too much. But if we talk about the practical uh, application of these preparations by various means, uh, because now we are also introducing our uh, uh, bio uh, uh, preparations uh, using the drones. Uh, so this is a discussion question, uh, like trichoderma. If we are talking about it, we are not introducing uh, metarhizium and bavarium, for, for example. So maybe, uh, yeah, yeah, these are for the soil. So the, yeah, sorry, Lyudmila, Yulia, just a, mo just a moment. Anastasia couldn't join us. So we can let the interpreters go. So thank you, Nicholas. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, goodbye. Mm -hmm. Thank you. See you next week. Mm -hmm. Nikolai, thank you very much. So next Thursday, uh, we hope that we are going to discuss a different topic. We are going to talk about the tillage of the uh, soil. So the English channel is being disconnected now. And we are going to continue to discuss issues in Ukrainian. So goodbye, Nikolai. Goodbye.
от я то бачу, що ви, по-моєму, це не вивчали. Ні, от саме тиск форсунок ні. Єдине, що ось я можу сказати по внесенню дронами, ну там зазвичай теж досить такий високий тиск, і потрібно бути дуже обережними в цьому випадку, тому що може бути забивання форсунок. На це потрібно дуже звертати увагу на фільтри. Ну, бо може, ну, можуть бути такі випадки, ми стараємося таке виключати, якщо є така можливість звертати увагу на кількість мікрон в сіточці оприскувача для того, щоб вже на виробництві пропускати під ту кількість мікрон, яку необхідні, но ці мікроорганізми. Тобто під дрони ми зазвичай стараємося зробити той препарат, де було б більше все-таки спори, менше міцелію гриба. Якщо говорити за грибні препарати, такі як там препарати на основі триходерми або княтіріума мінітенса. На ефективність це ніяк не впливає. Якщо говорити про триходерму і про склероцит, ну, тобто ті препарати, які грибні, по вегетації носяться дронами, то ефективність не знижується. Я перевіряла на полях, коли проводила фітосанітарні обстеження, все досить добре таки працює. Тобто, Умовно можу сказати, що тиск на них ніяк не вплинув. От. Але щоб було дослідження, де були різні умови внесення з різним тиском, і ми відстежували ефективність, то такого ми не проводили. Це так, досить такі цікаві запитання. З самого запитання. початку було понятно, да, що... Так, Микола Петрович, а ви як виробник біопрепаратів, у вас є якісь дослідження, які... От... Як тиск впливає на гриби, на міцелій, на потім ефективність? Ви нас там чуєте? Чи Микола Петрович як би є, але його як би немає, мабуть. Хорошо, ми потім піднімемо. У нас ще буде тема якраз по біологічні методи боротьби з хворобами, біологічні методи боротьби з шкідниками. Я думаю, що ми там відкроємо. Я дякую усім. Пропоную завершати, тому що ми так можемо говорити ще часами. Дякую усім. Наступний у нас 12 жовтня обробіта ґрунту та підбор техніки, методи боротьби з бур'янами, знаряддя та механізми. Бур'яни все ж таки це дуже важливо в органічному землеробстві, це дуже важлива така неприятна річ, як бур'яни, і з ними треба боротися. І ми це якраз обсудимо, обговоримо. Тому дякую всім, будемо завершати. До наступного четверга. Оставайтесь з нами. До побачення всім. Дякую.